Wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show. And start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Category Creation Series on the B2B Growth Show. I'm John Ruggi. Today's interview is one I've been really excited about because I had the chance to talk with a super sharp guy who's right in the middle of building a new software category called Conversational Marketing. That's right. Joining me was none other than Dave Gerhardt, VP of Marketing at Drift. Dave has not only helped build an amazing company, but he's also the co-author of a number one selling book on Amazon and the co-host of a fantastic podcast that, in my opinion, every marketer should listen to called Seeking Wisdom. I met with Dave at the Saster Conference in San Jose, and in our chat, he'll tell us more about what conversational marketing is, how that category came to be, and share some advice for evangelizing a category in the market. So without further ado, let's hear what Dave Gerhardt had to say about category creation. I have been really looking forward to this uh, interview because with me today is Dave Gerhardt, category creation guru, <laughs> and all things. This is amazing how you can do thing one. Do people? This is the, what's wrong with marketing. You do thing. You do something once, and then people say you're a guru. I don't know. I just did it. You know, like so. Yes, I'm not giving you a hard time. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, good deal. Well, <laughs> all right, so today we're going to talk about Drift's journey on conversational marketing, and uh, I'd love to hear more about this journey that you and uh, Dave have been on. But uh, sure. to so kind of kick things off and set the stage for us, just tell us what conversational marketing is. So conversational marketing is it's a whole new way of thinking about marketing and sales, where the traditional way of doing marketing and sales is all about later. Come to my website, fill out this form, and somebody is going to reach out with you later when it's convenient for them. But the big shift that's happening in marketing and in business over the last five, 10 years is customers have all the power today. And so you can't make people wait, right? Information is free now. I can find anything I want to know about a company without ever having to go to your website. So it's crazy to think that you're going to have, you're going to force people to go to your website, fill out something like a form, wait three days to hear back from your sales team, and then get a demo. So conversational marketing is all about connecting you now with the people who are ready to buy now while they're live on your website. So it's very much a kind of a reaction to the way buyers and sellers have been connecting and like you know people's needs to connect with humans have yeah you said the most important word there which is to me it's not about buyers it's not about sellers it's not about sales it's not about marketing it's about people and that's how people all communicate online today I press one button and I get a I got a lift here this morning with one button on my car right I ordered something from Amazon while I was here this morning to send back to my house and it's going to be there tomorrow when I get home you know there's there's countless examples of that that is how we all behave online in our real lives today, but then something happens when, you know, we're on the B2B growth show, right? Like, some, especially in B2B, something weird happens. Then we go to our jobs in B2B, and none of the tools that we use match how we actually buy as real people. Uh, and so that's the most exciting thing to me about conversation marketing is it's really closing the gap between B2C, B2B, whatever. We just call it, you know, B2P, marketing to people. Nice. So you guys are promoting this 
as a category that's bigger than just drift itself. And I'd love to hear like yeah, well, guys... that, that's an important point. But by definition, it can't be a category if you're the only company in it. That's right. And so you can't be like I am the you know I I created the category of iPhone cases. We're the only people that do it. And then it's not a category. That is something you do. There's a great book called Play Bigger by a guy named Christopher Lockheed and a, and a couple other authors, and it's all about category creation. And he talks about the importance of category design in that book. And he uses an example like you know Apple and the iPad. There are countless other companies that have tablets, right? Right. But Apple's the leader, and so as a result, they pull forward the whole category. It's only going to work if other companies can exist and it can create a bigger category than just that company itself. Um, another example, a great example in the book of a company that failed to create a category was Jawbone, the Bluetooth headset company. They just said, "This is our product. This is a feature of what we do." Blah blah blah. Right? Yeah. They didn't actually go out and, and do things to, to to elevate the category. And so ultimately, what we care about is growing the category of conversational marketing, not necessarily you have to use Drift. Sure. So when you guys sat down and started going through this process, did you say to yourselves, "All right, we are going to create a category and we're going to name it and we're going to evangelize it and this is the plan," or was it more like? Organic, or how did that come up? Uh, um, it was a little bit of both. Like I think, I think David and Elias, the, the founders of Drift, like they had a big vision from the start, and so, and if you go back and look at, if you go back to that the Play Bigger book, there's some great data that they have in there about basically like almost all of the successful, all of the successful IPOs in the last decade, 20 years, have all been category creators. He calls them category kings. Sure. And so, to build a company, they have a big, you know, 10 plus billion dollar vision for Drift. By nature, you have to build a category in order to, to have something that big and so they knew but but nobody was sitting around saying like what's our category you know because I think that's where you get paralyzed and you don't make any progress we just started going and, and working with customers and getting feedback and it was along the way people started to talk about it oh this is this is like conversation driven marketing this is conversational marketing this is conversational selling it's like having a conversation so we kind of started to see like these same phrases bubble up and we just kind of played around with all of them and we said Whoa, conversation. We, we actually call it, if you go back to probably three years ago from Drift, you see us call it conversation driven marketing. Okay. Because we hadn't named conversational yet because we got too caught up on like trying to find this perfect name. We wanted like a sexy name for it, but conversational marketing is what it was. And it really became a category when other people started saying it back to us. So it wasn't so much us saying this is what it's called, it's saying, oh, I'm doing conversational marketing. Oh, whoa, okay. All these people, and then all these people, you know, writing in, talking about it, blogging about it, podcasting about it, whatever became obvious to us okay this is a category now we need to own it and so then it became a messaging you know exercise in, in marketing where you know everything we got to mention it right every podcast yeah. every blog post every video it's, it's just like we call it reps and sets it's just about me messaging is all about repetition so you almost looked at it as a necessity given the aspirations of the company and you know you guys weren't building a better mousetrap. Exactly. Um, yeah, they started the company, David and Elias started the company to rewrite the playbook for sales and marketing. And so that's not going to get done by a feature, that's got to get done by a category. Right. And look at any industry, right? Look at look at like Tesla and cars. Did they invent electric cars? No. But are they the ones leading the category of, and if now you think of electric cars, what do you think of? Most people don't think of a Prius, they think of a Tesla. Yeah. Because they've built this whole company around it, and, and they're a good example of now pulling the category forward and you see lots of other companies there's a Super Bowl ad the other night I think it was Audi that said like by 2020 all their cars are going to be electric so all these people are going in the market now and, and nobody thinks of like well how is your electric car different than Tesla they're just thinking about this category of the future of cars is electric cars for us the future of marketing and sales is conversational marketing so do you still have a perception that Drift is just a live chat company because I remember when we you know, do I have that perception no, no. Not, not you but like <laughs> people that are looking at the space because I remember a few years ago when we were looking at Drift we had a limited understanding and I think maybe the product wasn't as fully evolved and we thought okay well there's a bunch of companies that do live chat and it really came down to like pricing in many ways because it's kind of a commoditized product sure. so yeah I think I mean, we do yeah there's some people that still think that but it but it's definitely not if you did a poll of our the people that use Drift they would say it's not live chat because <laughs> by nature, the reason sales and marketing people, go talk to any sales and marketing people, live chat has almost never worked in their business. And so we came into this market knowing that we have to like, what can we learn from that and how can we make it scale? The biggest problem we heard over and over was, it actually is a good sales channel, 
but I can't sift through the noise. Mm-hmm. And so everybody had to shut it off. Not everybody. I'm just, you know, doing what marketers do. I'm overstating things, right? right? But, but like you had to shut it off. You have a hundred conversations and you get two deals out of it. Those are good deals, but you can't spend your time worrying about the 98 and having to filter them out. And so, so our product team started thinking about like, well, what could we do then? How do we surface only the two good ones? Oh, what if we use bots to actually like answer questions for you and route, oh, the, these are support questions. They go here. These are sales questions. They go here. So then the only questions that a salesperson is going to answer are sales questions. And so we started to basically re, I don't know if re-segment is the right word, but we started to reposition live chat, right? And I remember writing like a, a sales letter, sales, old school copywriting style sales letter that was like, this is, Drift is not your traditional live chat. Here's why. Some, something like that, right? And it yeah. was like, look, I know that you think that live chat is this and this and this and this, but here's how it works with Drift. And so totally fine if people have that perception. But also we had to like, we had to gravitate towards something that they're using. And so we had to say, it's like live chat, but imagine it scaled. Okay. Or imagine you had a 24-7 assistant that was manage, managing your live chat for you. Then would it be a good channel? Yes. Okay. So, so it's like just about positioning like that. You know, we, we did have to reposition how people thought about live chat. So how do you know if you're succeeding in building conversational marketing as a category? Do you I mean, have like KPIs around this? Do you track like Google Trends? Yeah, or? We, we, we do, we do. I mean, we care about, there, there's a couple of things that we care about. So we care about, you know, the people who ultimately create categories for better or worse in this industry are often analysts. And so we care, you know, we have relationships with, you know, a bunch of the top analyst firms and, and we're working with them to help shape the category of conversational marketing. And so we have some KPIs internally about, you know, analyst relations, for example, all the other stuff that is important, right? What, you know, SEO and search is important. Google Trends is important. Mentions of conversational marketing. You know, how many articles are written about Drift and then also mention the phrase conversational marketing. But all that stuff is great and, you know, people want to measure that. But ultimately, it's one of those things that you know when you know. When some stranger comes up to me up there, I've never met in my life, I don't have anything from Drift on, and he says, man, I love conversational marketing. Put that in a spreadsheet, right? Like, measure that. I don't know how to do it, but you know it when you see it. I think the biggest mistake people make with categories is if nobody else is talking about it, then it's not a category. It's something you say. Right. It's something you, you, the way you position your company. And so, but it's great when other competitors start talking about it. So there's a lot of those things that don't fit in some perfectly quantifiable spreadsheet, but that you know. Another example is last spring, G2 Crowd added conversational marketing to their reviewed website. Okay. Pretty I mean, good. Like, is, that's a good measure, right? Like, I don't know how to quantify that, but I know that the, the leading consumer reviews platform in B2B added conversational marketing as a category for people to review software. Was that something that you guys drove, or did they do that on their own? A little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We, we sent them lots of customers. Look at what people are saying. Look at what people are saying. You should add this. You should add this. We, I, I'm not going to take credit for it, but we helped educate them on, hey, look, there's what pe- here's what people are doing. So. Sure. So you mentioned a scenario where you're the only ones talking about it, but it's not something really bigger than you. Do you see that as like, if that was the way things played out, would you see that as like a really negative situation or is that just, hey, you know, we ended up with a unique way of talking about ourselves. It didn't turn into a category, but at least we have some of our own language that separates us. Yeah, I think not every company can create a category, nor should you. Right. Because that think about how annoying that would be as a consumer. Oh, what does your company do? We are the crea- category creators of laptop cases. Like, you know, there's just too many. Like, you can go too too small. We don't need 10,000 categories. You, do, you can't have 10,000 categories. And so there's lots of different marketing and positioning strategies, right? You could be number two in a market, but you do it this way. You know, look at what's happened with Uber and Lyft, right? Lyft didn't create the category of on-demand ride sharing, but they hung in there, created a great product, and then there was a, some stuff happened with Uber, and a lot of people now are using Lyft, and then most people actually have both apps on their phone. I think you have to have a big enough addressable market to create a category versus we are the only people that do blah. That can just be, that's a little bit more of just a feature differentiator. We're the only people that make it this way. Sure. Great. Doesn't make you the category creator of that. So it's more of like a niche positioning play versus a category creation. Yeah. 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 So obviously, but, but ultimately, you will know whatever I say about categories doesn't matter. You, you will know 
when you'll know when you created a category when other people outside of your company are talking about it other competitors are trying to come into that market right people are asking for it people are asking for education around it people are asking for resources around it those are all like little you know signs of like warm spots that you should run towards so who else in drift is talking about conversational marketing and evangelizing you know besides you and david everybody the company that that is what we create right it's yeah. like it's like you work at tesla who's going to look at that guy's got a book right there there you go. Um, see? I think that's a good sign when it's people a good are buying sign. your book. Right, wrote the book. Everybody, it's a fundamental position. That, that's the company's job, right? Like, everybody should, needs to be talking about it. It's not just us. So walk me through. But at the same time, yeah. some people have to do actual work, right? So <laughs> I'm the one that gets to go do a lot of podcasts, but most people have much harder jobs. Sure. So walk me through how you guys educate the rest of your team on what conversation marketing is, how to talk about it, why it's important. I mean, there's a lot of ways. Like, you should know before you come into the company. We're not like, all right, company, we're going to now tell you about conversational marketing. People that join the company now know that Drift is conversational marketing. Right. So uh, we, we have a lot of things like just regular company rhythms. Like, in the onboarding process, we tell, uh, like, why Drift, why conversational marketing. There's a ton of content we've created that we give to everybody and, and put them through training on it. It doesn't mean that every single person is a marketing expert in the company, right? Like our finance person, you know, isn't going to tell you about how to optimize your funnel and double your conversion rate, but she can like competently speak to why conversational marketing is better than the traditional way. And so it just kind of, I don't have a good answer for you, which is why I answer this way, because it's integrated into everything that we do. You know, it's like, you can't be at the company without understanding why the company exists. And so there isn't like a, on, on this day, we do this thing and we train them this way. It just, it happens everywhere. It's sure. what we talk about. It's the content we create. It's the podcast, you know, interviews we do. It's the books that we write. It's the onboarding we, we talk about. It's the places we go speak. Like, it's integrated into everything. So you mentioned that it's part of the DNA now. But there, there was probably a time when it wasn't part of the DNA and you guys had to kind of pitch that internally and like make people aware of what that was. Is, how did that play out? Uh, we just told them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there is no secret answer. Like, we said, here, you know, we said, hey, we got a name for this thing. Here it is. And we had an index card and, or like a little one pager that we put on every single person's desk once we kind of had nailed down the tagline and the mission. And we said, we're just going to like rev on this. And we're just going to like, here it is. Look at it every day. Read it every day. We're going to randomly <laughs> quiz people, right? But then also, being inside the company, you see the marketing team and sales team start to create all this content around conversation marketing. You buy osmosis, you just learn it too. You know, there wasn't, there's not like this military style training on conversational marketing. And, it, and it's, there was never a day where like, you know, David stood up on a table and said, I'm, it's conversational marketing and, and you need to learn it. It just happens. Like, this is why we go to work every day. Everybody knows that products, like the product team, product design, engineering, they know that what they're building is for conversation marketing. Yeah. Marketers know that they better get smart on this and figure out how we're going to talk about it. Sales team, same thing. CS. And so it just was, there wasn't like a day, like it was not like September 5th, 2015, where he said, this is conversational marketing. But there was a moment when it was in the first press release and it was in the first blog post. And yeah. then it just becomes now, those two things have to be associated together, right? Okay. When we talk about Drift, we talk, it's conversational marketing. And, and there's a lot of stuff that comes with that. You got to write the framework, the how-to guides, the webinars, the videos and so it just everybody's always thinking about how are we creating stuff that's going to help people understand the, the, the category more sure so the big takeaway is you know you don't have to come down from on high with some stone tablets and no because I think it to the that's world. where people get caught up is they because the problem is when you when you have that big like declaration moment then if it doesn't work people are like well we can't go back on it yeah and so I think it was like a simple exercise of like we wrote a one liner and then we had like a hundred word version and we gave it to every single person in the company here's what we are here's why we exist here's the thing to take back to your desk with you and from then on it was like drift is conversation marketing but it doesn't take off until other people outside the company say it and so if you're just a ceo or a marketing person who's like this is a category I'm trying to beat it into your head yeah it's, your team is never going to pick that up 
It's when they go to a conference and somebody says, oh, you're the conversational marketing company, right? Or when they're on a webinar and they say, hey, does anybody have any resources on how I can roll out conversational marketing in my business? So people have to feel it firsthand. And by definition, unless people are talking about it, you don't have a category anyway. So it's more important what other people outside of the company are saying yeah. than having a CEO that's saying, guys, Drift is conversational marketing. Remember, no, it's got to come from outside. And that's, and that's hard because you can't have the one thing without the other, right? Sure. So you mentioned um, the product team a little bit earlier. How does the thought process around category affect your product roadmap? I think it, it just is like, it, it's kind of the why behind most of the product stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not on the product team, so I don't have the like perfect like uh, jobs to be done or whatever framework, you know, <laughs> that we use. But here's how I think about it. Like we have an email, I'll just give you one example. Like we have an email product, we have a landing page product. Okay. Black and white versions of those, people would say everybody has email. Everybody has landing pages. Our thread on that, though, or, or the thing that ties all those things together is conversations. And so that forces us to think about, well, what is conversational email? What is conversational landing pages? What is conversational whatever, right? And so it's just like that one word forces the product team to try to think about, well, how can we change this? If, if our fundamental stance for the company is that, you know, the internet should be one conversation, yeah. then how does that weave into everything that we build? So is that why you guys do emails in kind of a plain text version? Because that's more of a conversational way of emailing versus a really like polished yeah, that, that's newsletter? That's where it started. That's where it started. That's just from a design perspective. But ultimately what we, what we care about is that email becomes a conversation. Meaning the way that marketers have had to use email the last decade is a one-way channel. Yeah. Email is meant to be a two-way channel. But marketers have been using it as like, John, come to my webinar. And what happens if you actually respond to that email? Well, Most times nothing. you can't because it's do not reply at, yeah. or it just goes somewhere to some inbox where nobody's answering it, right? That is a terrible experience. Our belief is that like, if you reply like, hey, actually, I, I can't make it. Can you re-register my colleague blank? That should get handled, right? Sure. So it's just it's thinking about that from an evolution standpoint, right? Same thing with landing pages. Landing page today, most of them are static. You go to the landing page, put a bunch of info in, you're gone. What if that was a conversation, real-time conversation on the page? So it's just that that one, you know, topic has to weave itself into everything that we do from a product uh, perspective. And other conversations I've heard you had, um, you talk a lot about the importance of branding in the B2B space and how that's been undervalued a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and especially how it plays into category? I think branding is important for any industry and for whatever reason, B2B has just been behind. Brand is more important than ever today because back to what we said earlier about how people buy. Buyers are more, we are, as people, you and I are more skeptical than ever, right? Every as a person, don't think of, I'm not, not talking about me as marketer Dave and you as marketer John, like as Dave, the dad who's going to go home tonight, right? Yeah. Like that guy. I don't want to ever be sold to and I don't want to be marketed to. Well, shoot, that creates a heck of a problem if you're in sales <laughs> or marketing, right? Sure. But then we go to our jobs and we do all the things that we don't like. So brand is like creating that emotional connection with getting somebody to trust you and then you can talk about all the features. The other piece of it is every sales rep and marketing person in the world, and I do this too, says that their thing is better, it's faster, it's easier to use. And so even if you are, you know, even if this is the best phone in the world, I don't believe it because that's what everybody says, yeah. right? And so, so brand is your way to like break down those walls and to build a relationship and build trust first. And so the way we think about it is like, I want you to meet me at a conference like this and say, you know what? I like that guy. I want you to listen to the podcast. I want you to watch our videos. I want you to go to a conference. I want you to go to a webinar. I want you to like the pictures and words that we use on our homepage and our swag and our gear. Yeah. And then we earn the right to tell you about the features as opposed to the traditional model has been like, here's this thing, it's blue, you can click it here, it's faster, it's easier. No one believes that. And so brand is the thing that earns you the right to have the conversation. And, and just think about, you know, especially in tech today, everything is a commodity. There are a million companies that claim to do what Drift does or what Apple does or what Tesla does or what whatever. Why did I pick this sweatshirt versus a different one? You know, there's too much competition that brand is the only thing that you're going to be able to win on. Like one lesson from, from David, our CEO, he's like, go back and look at 
the um, consumer packaged good companies, right? Why do people pick a lo- one laundry detergent over the other? Brand. Yeah. Like P&G has cared about brand for a hundred years. And that is just now coming to B2B SaaS because now that's a commodity, right? Ten years ago, there was only one or two companies that did like landing pages. Mm-hmm. And so you could dictate the rules of that buying process. Right. Now, you could go here and find 15 companies that are doing landing pages. They're all going to tell you about the same features, 90%. How are you going to pick which one you're going to work with? You're going to, you're going to go to the one that, that you feel like resonates with you personally and has a brand. Yeah, I think you guys are a great example of that because I can speak from personal experience. When we were looking at the, the live chat space or the conversational marketing space and we looked at Drift, you know, I didn't understand all of the features, like some of the um, marketing automation stuff that you guys have and there's kind of a CRM component in there. Yeah. I didn't know that any was of that was in there, but I knew that the chat, you know, the, yeah. the core product was really good, and the vision you guys had for where you wanted to go totally. was That's, really solid. My, my my wife and I, we just bought a new car like a month ago, and we wanted, we knew we wanted a bigger car, better in the snow, safer kids, yeah. you know. And like a couple small features that we like, you know, she really wanted like the, the moon roof and, and heated seats. Okay. Other than that, the only thing that mattered is brand. And so we went with a Toyota Highlander because that's a, a very well known and well recommended brand, right? That's it. And I think people buy software the same way. Like you can't buy software because you know every little in and out and spec and tiny little thing because also the way people ship software now, that stuff is changing every day. So you're never gonna know all the features. So you gotta be able to make a bet and feel good about I wanna work with these people. And I think the important piece, like one example we've done is we got rid of all stock photos, no stock photos. The pictures on our website are either us yeah. or our customers because we are real people. And that resonates into all of our marketing. Like I want you to know me personally because that's who I wanna buy from. I wanna I wanna work with the people that you feel like you know and, and can trust, especially today in the world of like endless information and fake news and just crap all over the internet like you want to do business with people that you like and trust and so we believe that like you got to show your face you got to write like you talk you got to be I don't I don't care if I make a typo in an email because I actually wrote the email right like, yeah Obviously, I'm not making typos intentionally, but if I make one, I'm like, ah, sorry. I probably rushed that out. I was, like, running to a meeting, and I really wanted to send it. Sorry. But, like, that's real. Sure. Like, we're bringing all that realness back where people don't fall for, like, hello, John, as, you know, as VP of marketing at Block. Nobody falls for that stuff anymore. you got to be real. you got to be authentic. you got to be human. There was a video I saw on LinkedIn. I can't remember who did it the other day, but he basically took cold emails he got uh, on oh, LinkedIn. I saw that. He went to the mall. And he went to the mall, yeah. yeah. He's like, hey, I'd like to talk talk to you about yeah. your Q4 business goals. It's crazy. It's something that we think about a lot, which is like, read what you are going to market and sell with out loud. Read it out loud. Yeah. How's somebody going to react to that? Right. What? What did you just say? And we still, I still do it all the time. Like, I'll read something out loud. I'll, I'll write something and then I'll read it and I'll be like, whoa, why did I say synergy? I never have <laughs> used that word in my life, right? And so it just, it's just dumbing things down. And, and I mean, the other thing that bothers me is people sometimes are still like, I don't know about like emojis and, and using them in business. I'm like, look at every single, we're in a room right now with hundreds of people. I bet you every one of these single, every single person in this room has used an emoji in the last three hours. Would you think that's a safe claim? Yeah, sure. Okay. But so why can't you use that in business? Because it's business? Yeah. What's the difference? That is how people talk. And so I think it's all about understanding how people communicate and then figuring out how to put that into marketing. And the best marketing today is marketing that doesn't actually feel like marketing. I don't want to be marketing to. I want you to help. Yeah. So you talked about being human. You talked about the value of branding. What other skills that marketers in category defining companies, uh, what are the skills that they should have to really do well? you got to be able to tell a story. Like you got to be able to speak to the the shift, the big shift in the world, right? Which is this is something that I've learned from from a guy named Andy Raskin, who's awesome at helping companies kind of tell stories, because you can't like back to the stuff we were talking about earlier. If you create this little tiny category about you know podcast cables, <laughs> how are you going to get up on stage and deliver like the the world is broken, we don't have enough podcast cables, right? It's like you got to be able to tell a story that like punches people in the gut, and there's some emotional thing there. 
And that's got you got to have you got to be able to do that, and then do it in a way that's going to inspire other people, especially people inside of your company. And so back to your like question from earlier, where how do we get people on the same page? This only works if we can get. If I can't get up in front of our company, the employees at Drift, and get them fired up about conversational marketing, how on earth would I be able to get on a stage here? And it feels too contrived. And get strangers to do it. And so I think if you listen to you know me talk or David talk or whoever, like we are really passionate about it because we do. There is a problem, and we're trying to fix it. So I think you have to be able to tell a story. You have to be able to point to some bigger shift in the world, and you have to get really good at like laying out what to do next. Because the challenge now is people say, "I believe you. I know this is the future." But now what, right? And so you got to be able to tell like the high level aspirational story, but then you got to be able to deliver and say, okay, because in most cases that when you create a category, there's a change for people, and so you got to show them how to do it. Change in terms of like the way they're doing business or the way they're yeah, the way the whatever the category is, the way they're doing business, the way they work, right? Hey, it's gonna it's gonna be different, right? You know, the example that I use all the time is like just humans don't like change. We don't like change, right? I don't like change. You don't like change, but. People want, when it comes to marketing, people want, they want like the new results, but without the change. Uh And it doesn't work that way, right? You don't get to, I want to double my conversion rate, but I don't want to implement conversation marketing. Okay, right? Like you don't get to go out on the street and wave your hand and get a Lyft or an Uber. There's a fundamentally different way you have to call a cab now. You have an app, it's got to have your credit card on it and your picture. And so it's the same way for for B2B and in creating a category there is you got to show people like this is a shift, but we got your back. We're going to walk you through the shift. We're going to show you how to do it, right? It's like when you go get a new phone or new computer and at the Apple store, they take you everything. Like they transfer everything for you. They teach you how to use it. It's the same thing for categories. So sell the dream, but then help people see the steps that they can take starting day one to get there. Yeah, you have two two jobs. Number one is sell the dream. So then they ask you like, what's next? Okay, I'm in. What now? And then that's the most important point. Because then if you drop the ball there, your story almost doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Dave, I'm in. I'm in. You got me on conversation marketing. I'm in. Now what? Yeah, yeah. I better have some good case studies. I better have good examples. I better have good, you know, checklists to walk somebody through onboarding. Like, if I had nothing, then they're like, well, good story, man. Yeah, I can tell you a good story about anything. <laughs> but you got to be able to connect the two to actually be helpful. Good stuff. Well, yeah, I know we're almost out of time, but uh, you mentioned Play Bigger, obviously, conversational marketing, your book. Yeah. Uh, what other uh, resources, books, authors do you recommend? Uh, marketers who are interested in category design to check out. Well, I would go go listen to our podcast, podcast that David uh, Cancel and I, he's the CEO of Drift and founder. We, we do a podcast together called Seeking Wisdom. We talk about so many books. We're just big. I've learned from him to become like a learning nerd. And so we talk a lot about books we're reading. So that's one good place. Great lesson in category creation outside of Play Bigger is uh, the story about Salesforce, which is called Behind the Cloud, how, the untold story of how Salesforce, whatever, whatever. Great book, probably written in maybe 2005, 2006. Yeah. Um, Mark Benioff, the CEO, takes you through like all the plays about how they built the company starting in 99 all the way through IPO. It's a great lesson in category creation. Good deal. Dave, uh, if one of our listeners wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? I've been told that I'm not hard to find <laughs> to find on social media, but if you can't, uh, it's Dave Gerhart everywhere, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, everywhere you can find it. Good stuff. Thanks for being with us today. Sure. All Thanks right. for doing it. Take care. All right. Okay, well, that's it for this category creation episode of the B2B Growth Show. I'm John Ruggi, and if you have any thoughts you want to share about category creation, I would love to hear from you. You can find me by just typing john.marketing in your browser. That's J-O-H-N dot marketing, and you can find all of my contact info there. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Digital marketing agencies have a tough job. You have to stay on top of the latest marketing strategies for your clients and your agency. What if there was a way you could address both at the same time? Imagine your agency putting out content with greater quality and quantity. Envision bringing your clients a turnkey solution for one of B2B marketing's fastest growing media strategies, podcasting. You know all those clients asking for your help with their account-based marketing efforts? Picture being the first to bring them the idea of content-based networking, showing them the proven strategy for breaking into their most coveted accounts. Here's the concept. Sweetfish Media is looking to work with a limited number of innovative agencies interested in a new partnership model. We produce a podcast for your agency, 
you introduce the power of podcasting and Sweetfish services to your clients. Everybody wins. Learn more at sweetfishpartners.com.